Recording is probably. Well, welcome back as we continue our study of uh, the Beatitude or the Sermon on the Mount, excuse me. Today we happen to be covering the Beatitudes. And uh, we started uh, the Sermon on the Mount last week, did some introductory work last week. So we only covered the first couple of verses. So uh, today we'll be jumping into, as I said, the Beatitudes in, in Matthew chapter five, verse number three. Uh, but before we dig into that, let's start with the word of prayer. Dear God, Heavenly Father, we are blessed. We are blessed to be numbered among your people. We are blessed by gathering in your presence today. We are blessed by this word that we read. We are blessed by the fellowship we share with one another. We thank you for these and the abundant blessings that you give to us. And we pray now that these blessings would accomplish the will and desire of your heart in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. As I said, we'll be in, in uh, Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse number 3. Uh, the Beatitudes, but I just I I, I want to uh, to mention once again as we start the Beatitudes that um, last week as we talked about the setting of the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, we were introduced to the crowds of people that were there and the disciples that were there, and we talked about how as Jesus speaks the words of this sermon, he's really speaking to his disciples. Now the crowds probably overhear it. The crowds may be listening. The crowds may be interested but they are not the ones that Jesus is directing this message to. Okay? He's directing this message to his disciples. And that's uh, important, very important to understanding the Beatitudes over, or the Sermon on the Mount overall, but especially to under, the understanding of the Beatitudes, to understand that as Jesus speaks these words of Beatitude, these words of blessing, he's speaking to those who are already his disciples. They're already believers. They already follow Jesus. They already have the gift of salvation. And so Jesus is, is describing what, uh, what they receive or what life is like for them now as his, as his disciples. So uh, with that introduction, I also want to just uh, kind of share this on the Beatitudes in general. So there are nine Beatitudes in this. And the, the way we're going to look at the Beatitudes is in four sets of two pairs. And then with a final concluding Beatitude, okay? And as we do it that way, what we're going to notice is, is those two pairs are related to each other. The pairs are related to each other. Um, so the first and second of those pairs kind of help us understand the other one. And that's the way we're going to kind of look at it, kind of these four different sets um, and then a final concluding Beatitude. And it's also important to, to kind of uh, realize that, that part of the background for the Beatitudes is found in Isaiah chapter 61. Um, and uh, we, we know that because uh, a lot of the, the language is, is similar. Some of, the, uh, some of the words that Jesus uses in the Beatitudes are similar to what Isaiah used in chapter 61. And so we're going to take a brief look at Isaiah 61. We're not going to read the whole chapter. You can certainly do that on your own sometime. Um, but just a brief look at some of the themes and ideas of Isaiah 61 to help us uh, uh, kind of understand better what Jesus is going to be talking about in the Beatitudes. Um, <clears throat> now, Isaiah 61 is uh, uh, spoken here. The, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me is how it starts out, right? And so this is a, a messenger of God who's speaking these words, okay? Now, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it is definitely significant that later on in the book of Matthew, uh, remember the day when Jesus was in the synagogue and he opened the scroll and read from the scroll in the synagogue? Jesus read these words. And then when he got done reading these words, he put the scroll down and said, uh, today these words have been fulfilled. So Jesus identifies himself as, as, uh, as this, uh, as kind of as this speaker, okay? And here's what he says. The, the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of de despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. 
uh, and goes on from there. Like I said, you can uh, can read more on your own if if you'd like. But you know, he he uses some some key words about who who Jesus or who God is coming to, right? Who Jesus has come for: the poor, the brokenhearted, the captives, those in darkness, uh, those who mourn, right? And these same people are going to be identified in um, the Beatitudes of Jesus, all right? And so Jesus is uh, essentially applying the words of Isaiah 61 to our life as disciples. Here's now uh, what, what you receive. You know, in, in Isaiah, it's just, okay, here's, here's the message this servant is going to give, right? And in Matthew, Jesus is saying, not only am I giving you the message, but I'm also giving you a blessing. And he's going to talk about the blessing that comes from this message, okay? So any, any comments or questions about what we read there in Isaiah 61 or how that might relate? Okay, let's jump into the Beatitudes then. We said, well, take it in, in four pairs. And so we'll take two Beatitudes together. Uh, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And we'll spend a little more time on this first set, uh, just because it'll help us understand all the others. And, uh, you know, there's obviously kind of some repetition that goes on, but it starts out with that word blessed. Blessed. What does it mean for you to be blessed? What does that look like? What does that involve to be blessed? The Lord's been good to me. Okay. Okay. What else? Maybe it's the same thing, but I feel like I'm being looked after. He's looking after me. Okay. Looking after. I think it might have something to do with um, keeping us in, in the faith and not going astray. Sure. There's that connection to faith. Absolutely. Thank you so much when you're telling me about the last and, and the blessing that you get at the end of the service and so forth. It's all, it's almost like he's laying his hands on you that he's okay uh, you know that, 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 and and that uh, that through his words and through his just uh you know presence that he he is you know giving you that special anointing that yeah thing. what a great way to a kind of picture to just look at that god laying his hands on you that special anointing great it's something i can't read for myself okay yeah, the, the, the blessing is something external, right? It's something I can't do for myself. I can't have for myself. <coughs> and, you know, obviously in our conversation and in our, in our context, right? All, all of you mentioned about what God does, right? Um, so often when people talk about being blessed or blessings, you know, uh, a lot of times it's a lot of, earthly stuff that gets listed or, uh, you know, and, and sometimes depending on who you're around, God might be completely left out of the equation. But obviously for us as, as God's people, we know the source of that blessing, right? We know what it means to be blessed by him and where that comes from. And, and, and that's important. Now, um, uh, you may remember the, uh, uh, I think he, he had a show on TV way back when, uh, Robert Schuler. Uh, he had the Crystal Cathedral out in California, perhaps heard of that place. He wrote a book about the Beatitudes, and he, he um, translated instead of blessed, he translated it happy. Happy. Now, I, 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 think, I think there is an element to happy here, but being blessed goes far beyond being happy. Right? Being happy is about external circumstances and about things going right. Happy is temporary. Happy is short-lived. Happy is something we create, right? And so to be blessed goes much, much deeper than what it means to be happy. And I can be very unhappy, but that does not erase 
the blessings that I yeah. receive. Yeah, to be blessed is a, it's an identity thing. Yeah, and, and you're right, you can be unhappy, you can have a miserable situation and still be blessed, right? Because that comes from God to you. So it's not dependent on that other stuff. Um, and I'm going to just look at, at, at a little bit about how Matthew uses this word blessed. Um, maybe. There we go. So a couple of times where Matthew uses the word blessed, or Jesus obviously uses the word blessed. Um, the first one, Jesus replied, and this is after Simon Peter gives his his confession of faith. Remember, Jesus asks him, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my father in heaven. All right. Is this the same Jonah that was afraid to go to heaven? No, no. Yeah. Uh, it would have been uh, Peter's father. Yeah. We don't know any more about him than that. But, uh, so we see here this, uh, the, the fact of Peter being blessed comes from his statement of faith, right? So just like we connected being blessed with faith, that's what we see in Peter's life, that being blessed came from faith. And what's the sense here as Jesus speaks those words to Peter? When is Peter blessed, according to kind of as Jesus speaks those words? Is Jesus talking about a future blessing? For Peter? No. No. Right yeah. Now. Right now. Right now, Peter, you today are blessed because you believe these things, right? Be because you have this faith, you are blessed right here, right now. Okay. So there is this uh, very much in Matthew and in Jesus, uh, the way Ma Matthew presents Jesus, there is this present um, blessing, this present state of being blessed uh, that his disciples have. Now, the second one's a little different. This is... Um, uh, Jesus here is talking about end times, right? This is as he is talking about future and his return. Um, and he says this, blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. <coughs> so this is more of a future blessing, right? When, when a servant is doing such and such, and his master comes, there is a blessing in store for him, right? He will be set over many things. And so, uh, so I think it's important to look at it that way, because as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, these blessings of Jesus, uh, to be blessed by Jesus is something that happens now, and it's something that happens in the future. And, and that's the way that Jesus in Matthew's gospel talks about being blessed. It's something that happens now, and it's something that happens in the future. And we definitely see that throughout the Beatitudes, okay? We must have <clears throat> some time ago uh, studied part of Matthew because I have an old uh, uh, note in this margin, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, verse <clears throat> three. It says uh, that I, have, I wrote, relying on God for salvation and all things. Now, that must have been an underlying something that somebody said that was. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great understanding of verse three, because what is he going to next here? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Okay, poor in spirit. Um, notice the kind of poverty. Jesus is very specific about the kind of poverty here. He's not talking about a, a poor in your bank account. He's not talking about, um, you know, poor in terms of the kind of house that you live in or the kind of clothes that you wear. But he's talking about a poverty in spirit. When you think of poverty, right, uh, poverty is that state of not having enough, right? You don't have enough. You don't have the right resources, right? That's what a state of poverty is. And Jesus says, is calling this a poverty of spirit. Right? You don't have enough resources spiritually. You are spiritually bankrupt. Right? And, and, and you don't have what it takes. 
Jesus is describing us, right? When it comes to our salvation, we are all spiritually bankrupt, right? We are all in poverty. We don't have what it takes. We don't have the resources. We don't have the abilities. We are spiritually bankrupt, right? And so that's who Jesus, Jesus really essentially is describing everyone here, right? I mean, all of humanity in that sense is spiritually bankrupt, but not everyone realizes it. There are, some, there are a lot of people out there living life thinking they're just fine. They don't need anything spiritually. They're doing okay. Um, so Jesus is not necessarily speaking to them, right? But Jesus here is speaking to those who now are aware that, hey, I am spiritually bankrupt. Remember, he's talking to disciples. He's not talking to crowds of people. He's talking to disciples, believers, people already part of the kingdom of heaven. And even though we're part of the kingdom of heaven, we realize, doggone it, I'm not good enough. Not good enough. Okay, thoughts or questions on that poor in spirit idea? And what do they get, the poor in spirit? Or in what way are they blessed? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Notice that notice the tense of that word there is. It's not a future that one day you're going to get heaven. No, you belong to the kingdom of heaven right now. Today, in this very moment, Jesus says, you belong to the kingdom of heaven. It's not something you got to wait for someday. But you belong to the kingdom of heaven right now. So he's talking about believers, not the people that don't believe. Right. He's talking to his believers, to his disciples. Yeah. He's not talking to those crowds that are listening. Yeah. He's talking to his disciples. Yeah. Right now, you are in the kingdom of heaven today. But not because you bought your way in, not because you paid your way in, not not because you had an admission ticket. You are in the kingdom of heaven in spite of the fact that you are poor in spirit and you are bankrupt and you have nothing to offer. Now, this kingdom of heaven idea is huge in Matthew's gospel. We saw it first introduced in um, at the end of Matthew chapter 4. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. You see, Jesus is the kingdom of heaven, right? Uh, in, in Matthew's gospel, wherever Jesus goes, the kingdom of heaven is there, right? Jesus is God in the flesh. And so, uh, so Jesus brings with him the blessings of the kingdom of heaven. In this case, he talks about the healing of the sick and the diseased. Why? That's part of the blessing of the kingdom of heaven. And where Jesus goes, the kingdom of heaven goes. And so they received that blessing because they were in the presence of Jesus. Right? <laughs> and so that's really Jesus' job and Jesus' whole task in, in Matthew is to bring the kingdom of heaven to people. And here in, in, uh, in the Beatitudes, he's, he's already done that. Because these people are believers, they're disciples, they're following him. They're already in part of his kingdom, they're already part of his people. Okay. Thoughts or questions on the poor in spirit? And next in verse four, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. Who mourn what? Either death or their own sinfulness. Yeah. Okay. So now we know it is a biblical truth that those who mourn death will find comfort in God. That, that's a biblical truth and we can't deny that, right? But here, he's really talking about sorrow over sin, especially if we're connecting the two. Remember, we said these, these Beatitudes come in pairs, right? And so if, if verse 3 and verse 4 are a pair, right, they're going to be connected in some way. And if these two are a pair, blessed are the poor in spirit, <coughs> blessed are those who mourn. So what's the mourning? It's this mourning over the fact that I'm poor in spirit. 
and I'm a sinner and I live in a sinful world and, and I don't have enough to offer. And, and I'm, I feel sorry for that. And I, and, and that grieves me, right? That grieves me that I sin, that grieves me that there's a world of sin. That's, that, that's something that's heavy upon my heart and causes grief within me. Right. And, and that's really what Jesus is getting at there. It's, it's those who mourn sin. Now, have people applied this and used this to talk about comforting those who mourn death? Absolutely. Um, is, that, is that a wrong way to use it? I don't think it's necessarily what Jesus meant here, but like I said, it's still a biblical truth that we can look elsewhere in scripture that Jesus provides comfort for people who mourn death. It's just a little bit different. So we wouldn't know that exactly unless we were in a, a Bible study. What, what, what he's talking about, what the bottom line is there, that because I would think when most people would read that, they would think of mourning death. Sure, yeah. Not that knowing that we are sinners. Right, right. So, um, I guess that's why we're here. Yeah. Well, and the usage of the saying we will be comforted makes you think that it's sometime in the future. Yes. But I guess maybe it's just referring to forgiveness here. Um, or if it's not talking about something that happened at death. So the, the, the will be is definitely a future. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's the reality that, that in this life, until the day we die, we will grieve sin, right? Because we are not yet perfected, because the world is not yet perfected. So there will always be an element within us that is grieving the sin of the world. So that's, that's yeah, that's why it's that future tense, right? And you're going to notice the first one we said was present. You are in the kingdom of heaven now. The next ones from here on are going to be future, right? You know, you, and, and so there's this tension here in Matthew that you've got it. You're part of the kingdom of heaven. You're part of this family. You're, you, you are blessed now, but you don't have all the benefits. There's still, there's still more blessings to come. And there's kind of this tension. I've got it, but I don't yet have it. I've got it, but I want more, right? And, and we see that tension throughout this, throughout this text. My Bible doesn't say will be comforted. It says shall be comforted which seems to be if something shall be it's inevitable <clears throat> yeah I, I think that's I, I don't think we use shall very much in english but I, i've been told that's part of the kind of proper way of using shall right it's it's a uh, uh it, it's 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 more of this of, there's more certainty in the use of the word shall than, than the word will. Shall or not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that whole, uh, that morning reminds me, well, the poor in spirit also reminds me of Romans 7. You know, Romans 7 is where Paul talks about the good that I want to do, I don't do it. And, and, and the evil that I, I don't want to do, I find I keep my, doing it, right? He's talking there about his poverty of spirit. And he ends that with this, what a wretched man I am, who will rescue me? Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? You know, you hear that sadness, that mourning, that poverty in Paul's plea. You know, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me? Um, and by the way, in the next verse, I should have put that up there. 725, he says, thanks be to God, <laughs> you know, for Jesus Christ. So Paul knows where the rescue comes from. He's received the rescue. But at the same time, he's still grieving the fact that he even needs it. He's grieving the fact of who he is and uh, the sinfulness that's within him. <clears throat> so that comfort is, as we said, kind of a future. We, we, we get it now. I think you're right, Bill. We get it now in the forgiveness of sins. But we keep on sinning. <laughs> And our world is still filled with sin. And so we, we can, even though we get it now in forgiveness, we continue to grieve. When will it be perfect? It will be perfect in, in eternity. Revelation 21, 27 says this. This is talking about eternity, okay? Nothing impure will ever enter it, 
nor will anyone who does what is shameful and deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the book of Lamb's Book of Life. Nothing impure, nothing shameful, nothing deceitful means there's no sin. There's no evil in the world or in us. That is the day we will fully feel that comfort, right? Um, until then, we're going to continue to grieve, right? But we, but we do so knowing uh, that we are blessed now. Even though I have to grieve now, I'm blessed because I know what's coming. Because I know what's coming. Okay. Questions about poor in spirit and grieving sin. or thoughts that you might have on that. <laughs> so next, next two. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Okay, when, you, when you hear about the meek, what do you think of? Somebody shy that will take a stand. Okay. There's a, yeah, sometimes it's maybe a bit of a negative connotation that goes with that a little bit. What else? The meek. I think quiet. I think somebody who really is not much noticed. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think that's all part of it. I think sometimes what we think of too, when we think of, or when we hear this, right? Blessed are the meek. Sometimes we start to think, oh, uh, Jesus is asking me to do meek things here, right? Jesus is telling me to, to be a meek person. Um, but, but really this is not a command of Jesus here. He says, blessed are the meek. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a description of the way his disciples are and feel and are treated at times. Um, so the, the commentary I'm using says that Jesus uh, really is connecting his idea of meek here uh, to Psalm 37. Uh, let's see if I put this up here. Yeah, I did. <clears throat> so Psalm 37 <coughs> um, is really a parallel to what Jesus says. And Psalm 37 is a psalm of David, and, and what's happening in, in that psalm is, is that um, is that the people of God or the, the, the person that they're talking about is really being kind of trampled down, right? It is being, um, almost being oppressed is, is one way to look at it, right? Um, and so it says, they say in that psalm, but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. So it's, it's spoken to a people... Um, and the, the commentator I read that says it's, you know, maybe a better way to translate it, it would be lowly, lowly, right? So, uh, so they're, um, you know, they're not the high and mighty. They're not in positions of prestige. They're not in positions of power. They may even be persecuted, which Jesus is going to talk about at the end of the uh, Beatitudes here, right? They're, they're lowly. They're lowly. And, and, and so it's not something that you choose to do. It's not something that you seek out, but it's just who you are, right? That as a disciple, you become a lowly one. Right? And there are times in your life where you're going to feel like a lowly one, where you're going to feel like the world is, uh, is ruling over you or oppressing you or pushing you down, right? Um, where you just can't catch a break. Sometimes you're going to feel that way as a disciple. And, and that's what Jesus is talking about there. In my Bible, as a note, 
it refers to Psalm 3711 also, and it says that this refers not so much to an attitude toward man as to a disposition before God. Mm -hmm. Humility. Yeah, I think that, that certainly we're, we are also supposed to view ourselves as lower than God, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the context of the psalm really shows the context of the psalm is not when he talks about the meek in the psalm, he's not talking about their relationship with God, but he's talking about their relationship with people who are more powerful than they are. Yeah. And notice the same in the psalm, it's the same thing, the same blessing, right? They will inherit the land or they'll inherit the earth. Okay. And again, it's in the future tense. It points us again to Revelation 21, verse 1. It says, John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. All right? God is going to recreate the world. And, and so... In the Beatitudes, when Jesus says, you know, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. He's not talking about, you know, uh, one day you're going to, you know, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. You're going to be rich. And one day you'll be in power. One, you know, he's not talking about the health and wealth gospel here. He's saying, no, at the end of time, I'm going to create a new world. I'm going to create a perfect world. And you get to be a part of that. And that belongs to you. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. And then if we're connecting these two, um, these two, uh, you know, verse five and six, again, we, we're seeing these beatitudes coming in pairs. And he says, next, blessed are those who hunger and thirst, right? So he's just said, you're going to inherit the earth. What are we hungering and thirsting for? I want that now, <laughs> right? I want that now, right? I want that inheritance today. I long, this is a longing for heaven. This is saying, man, I, it, this, this, this world stinks and, and I want what God has to offer in the world to come. I need that. I want that. I desire that. I yearn for that, right? That's what he's talking about here. He describes it as a hungering and thirsting for righteousness. <coughs> um, or, you know, righteousness in that sense of, you know, things that are right. And I think along with verse five, it's kind of things are right in the world. You know, things are right in the world. Everything's the way it should be. And I want that day. I believe we as God's people do, don't we? Again, Jesus is describing God's people. He's saying when you, when you, when you are part of my people, when you're, when you're a disciple, when you're living in the kingdom, you know, this is what's, this is what's going to be on your heart. You're going to be, just have this desire for having a desire for eternity and what God's blessing you with there. And notice again, future tense will be filled. In other words, that desire is going to be satisfied, right? That desire for the right things, that desire for the good things, that desire for eternity is going to be satisfied. Um, we see that again. Let's look at Revelation 7. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching heat. Uh, now I think Revelation 7 here is actually probably talking about physical hunger and physical thirst, right? But I think we can relate it to what Jesus said. You know, there's a, there's a day where those desires based on the needs Go away because we have everything we need and everything is made right. <coughs> All right. Questions, comments, thoughts on, on five and six. How about this? So as you hunger and thirst for that which is right, as you hunger and thirst for you know, what, what's coming in eternity, what are you most looking forward to? What are you most saying? Ah, that's what I need. That's what I want. I won't have to wait anymore. <laughs> the waiting will be done. So I guess that means we don't need patience in heaven, do we? Never thought of that. 
cool. What else? What are you looking forward to? Seeing Jesus. Seeing Jesus. Yeah. Free from sin. Okay. You don't need to try to do anything. All your all your labor is on you. Yeah. I know what Jesus will go on to say here, you know, in Matthew, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, I will give you rest. Yeah, that's what you're talking about, Susan, that rest. Labor's done. The burden's done. Whew. It's going to be good, isn't it? It's going to be good. I think, you know, <clears throat> depending on our experiences, sometimes we're looking for different parts of heaven. That's okay. You know, someone who's in pain might be looking forward to a life of no pain. Someone who's blind might be looking forward to being able to see again. Right? Uh, it just kind of depends on what we're experiencing in life. You know, whatever's not right in this world, we're going to look forward to that being right in the next world. And so what you're looking forward to forward to today may be different than what you look forward to next week and that's okay there's plenty to look forward to <clears throat> all right nine and ten blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So we hear first about the merciful. Remember, who's Jesus talking to? Disciples. The disciples have already been shown mercy, haven't they? That's why they're disciples in the first place, <laughs> right? And the fact that they've already been shown mercy means that they now become merciful people. They are filled with mercy. And, and, and I, I think it's, so again, it's, it's kind of it's like, you know, when Jesus said, blessed are the meek, right? Or the lowly. It wasn't a command to go and do meek things and do lowly stuff. This is not a command to go do acts of mercy, although there's plenty of places in scripture that tell us to go do acts of mercy, right? So we know we're supposed to do it, but this, this is not one of those commands, but this is an identity statement. Blessed are the merciful. He's talking to people who are filled with mercy, right? These are disciples who've already received the mercy of God in their lives who've already received the mercy of Jesus Christ in their lives. Therefore, they have that within them and they start to show mercy to others, right? They start to give mercy to others because that's what they've received. So that's, that's who the merciful uh, really are. The merciful are those that have been forgiven. Absolutely, yeah. Yep. And they will forgive others. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the parallel in Matthew to this would be Jesus, uh, the parable of the, uh, the unforgiving servant. Uh, remember there was the master who had two servants that owed a huge debt and and, and one, he forgave the guy's debt, and then that guy went and, and forgave the debt of others, while the other guy, he forgave the debt, and that guy went and had his debtors thrown in prison, right? And, and so Jesus, you know, the merciful servant, right? We've been, we forgive because we've been forgiven. We have mercy because we've received mercy. <clears throat> While scripture talks a lot about mercy and being merciful and the merciful nature of God, uh, this kind of exact use of the word merciful only occurs one other place in scripture, and that's in Hebrews chapter two. I think we learned something significant here from this. For this reason, he, uh, talking here about Jesus, had to be made like them 
fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. So Jesus here is, that same word is used to describe Jesus, merciful, right? And so in the Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, where does, how do you, how do you become the merciful? It's when you got Jesus, because he's the merciful one. He became the merciful one for us. And so that's now who we are, right? We go about life as merciful people, doing merciful things. And when we do that, as he says here, we will be shown mercy. Again, this is not a salvation issue. He's not saying you're saved because you're nice to people. If he were talking to the crowds, we could make that argument, right? If Jesus were talking to the crowds, you'd say, blessed are the merciful crowds because you'll be shown mercy. So if he's talking to the crowds, he'd say, you guys go out and be nice to people and I'll be nice to you. No, he's talking to disciples who he's already been nice to. <laughs> They've already received mercy. So when he talks about they will be shown mercy, he's not talking about being forgiven. He's, but he's talking about, again, will be at the end of time, we're going to see the full mercy of God on display in eternity. Then okay. um, next, uh, he talks about the pure in heart will see God. So again, if we see these in pairs, right? Um, the pure in heart is not a command. He's not saying to the crowds, go out and be pure in heart, people, so you can see God. No. He's saying to his disciples, you are already pure in heart, right? He's describing our identity as his people. Your identity as a child of God is you are merciful and you are pure in heart. That's what you have. That's what you've been given. Right? And when you have that, when you've been given that, you will, you will see God. Um, and there's a connection here with this idea of pure in heart to Psalm 24. I think this was a Psalm of David, if I remember right. <coughs> The psalmist um, says, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in the holy place? He's talking about worship here, right? Coming into God's presence. Uh, uh, this, this whole psalm is kind of a worship context. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false God. And when, when, when someone in, in Old Testament, when they went to the holy mountain and the holy place, right? That was where the presence of God was at. That was where you could see God. That was where you could be with God. That was where you would be in the presence of God. Right? And who can do that? The one with clean hands and a pure heart. And that's what, uh, what Jesus is saying to us is you've got that pure heart, which means you will see God face to face, right? In eternity. Again, he's talking about future things here. You will see God face to face in eternity. Um, and uh, talking about that blessing that we're going to receive. In the Russian Orthodox Church, um, you cannot the act the lay a lay person cannot go into the Holy of Holies mm. place. That's only for priests, um, because um, you're not clean enough to go into the Holy of mm. Holies. Really kind of carried over that Old Testament understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Thoughts or questions about these two, the <clears throat> merciful and pure in heart. What does verse, uh, I, I have a different uh, translation here. What, what, what does verse 10 say again? Of, in Matthew? Yeah. Okay, we're, we're not, here we are. Oh, okay. Yep. We're, okay. I, um, I may have said 10, but I, no. I didn't mean it. Okay. <laughs> we're just getting there. 
Because, yeah, it probably sounded really different than what I just read. <laughs> Here's 9 and 10. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what do you think of when you think of peacemakers? They're not warriors. Okay. Sort of a mediator, someone who tries to uh, bring people together yeah someone who tries to bring people together right yeah they're not going to divide people they're not going to fight they're going to they work to bring people together and i'll be honest i think as i've read as i've read the the beatitudes and as i hear the beatitudes talked about most often i think of and i think people think of exactly that when we hear peacemakers right someone who's working between people to bring them together uh, the commentary I read I made a very convincing argument to me that that he's probably not referring to peacemakers necessarily between people, but it's more peacemakers between us and God. Um, and if you see how Jesus describes the work of a disciple in Matthew chapter 10, we made reference to this last week. Matthew chapter 10 is where Jesus sends his disciples out to the world and gives them instructions about what they are to do. And here's what he says. Interesting. As you enter a home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it's not, let your peace return to you. Interesting. Disciples here are to bring peace, right? And uh, the commentary I'm, I'm using suggests that, that when he talks about let your peace rest on that home, really what he's talking about is delivering the message of God right? Delivering the blessings of God and the things of God to that person and that individual. And if something does, someone doesn't receive you or someone doesn't, you know, rejects that offer, then you don't give them, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the things that, that you're there to deliver that message of God, because they've rejected it. They don't want it. Right. And so peacemakers there really is, is about peace between us and God. He's talking about the work of a disciple to go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ when he talks about peacemakers. Um, and then if we, if we think of this, you know, again, kind of the connection between um, that, that these uh, Beatitudes come in pairs, that helps us connect peacemakers with persecuted, right? People are not, although sometimes they are, but most of the time people are not persecuted for being a peacemaker between people, right? Uh, we, we laud them, we celebrate them. We, do, we have a Nobel Peace Prize for people that are peacemakers between people. That's a good thing. We lift that up. They're not usually persecuted for it. But how many Christians over the centuries have been persecuted for trying to be a peacemaker between people and God and delivering that message of God's kingdom all the time, right? Thousands, hundreds of thousands, probably millions of Christians have been persecuted because they seek to be a peacemaker and, or bring that message of peace, the message of God's peace into the world. Um, I think an interesting connection there. And notice the end of verse 10 again. So he started out. There's is the kingdom of heaven. Here's, you're part of the kingdom right now, guys. And one day you will be this, you will be that, you will be this, you will be that. And then he, now at the, as he's wrapping up, coming to the conclusion of the Beatitudes, he brings it back around. There says the kingdom of heaven. Right now, you're, you're part of this kingdom. You're part of us. You, you belong to me. Um, you know, it's just beautiful the way that Jesus kind of does this and, and communicates this. Questions or thoughts about this peacemakers persecuted idea? I, if, if the Beatitudes were uh, if Jesus was teaching the disciples, um, I guess I always thought that 
this related to us, not just the disciples. Yes, because we are disciples. Yeah, we are disciples of Jesus. And that's the point. Yeah, this is about you. Yeah. Okay, so it's not just specific. The it's not just for the 12, right? Okay. Yeah, when we use it, when I use that term disciples, I'm using it in the broad okay. sense of anyone who believes in Jesus. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So that's you. Like you ministers and the uh, missionaries that's they're trying to make peace with those people. Sure. Yeah. Believe. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And, and just like, uh, you, you know, you do in your homes when, when you, uh, give a, you know, tell them story of Jesus to your kids or your grandkids, or, uh, you know, that's part of being a peacemaker too. Yeah. Again, Jesus is, this is an identity thing, you know, as disciples, you are peacemakers. You are ones who deliver that message of God's peace to people. Yeah. Peacemakers are not from along in the world. <clears throat> no, and from that sense of those who deliver the message, yeah. sure. Yeah, for we will. For strangers. We will be persecuted, right? Yeah. And then the concluding verses here. Jesus kind of wraps it up. Blessed are you when people insult you. Okay, so uh, it's interesting. He's gone from uh, he's gone from the he, he's talking uh, you know throughout here in the Beatitudes. He's talking third person. Blessed are the ones who mourn. Blessed are they. He's talking about third person, right? And so the disciples, so those listening, could be saying, "Well, yeah, I'm I'm one of those poor in spirit." That describes me. But they also could be saying, "No, not feeling that today." You know what I mean? As they could be saying, "Yes, I'm a peacemaker," and others could be saying, "No, nope, not me." And so it's all third person. And now it's in the second person, you, you know, he's, 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 he's speaking now directly to them and saying this, this actually describes you guys. I'm talking about you guys, right? Blessed are you when, not if, <laughs> when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we see this tension at once again, right? Rejoice and be glad. That's what you can have right now. Great is your reward in heaven. You don't have that yet. It's coming. And notice the joy doesn't come in the persecution. Yay, they persecuted me. Yay, they don't like me. No. Rejoice and be glad because I'm looking forward to something better, right? And throughout the Beatitudes, he's talking about the something better that you're looking forward to. But he's also saying throughout the Beatitudes that something better you're looking forward to is not just, not just a future hope, but it's, a, it's also a present reality. You know, it's something, you've got it now. You're part of the kingdom of heaven now. And so you, you, you already reap some of those blessings now today. Um, you won't get the fullness of it until the end of time. Um, and so that's, again, going back to that tension we feel as God's people. I've, I've got it, but I, 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 I got more coming. And so I hunger and I thirst and I'm ready and I want it and I need it. And until then, I can rejoice and be glad. Not in the persecution, not in the hungering and thirsting, not in the evil of sin, not in the poor spirit, but rejoice and be glad for what's coming and, and what God promises in Christ. I think the explanation of peacemakers that you gave in, in verse nine is really supported by this because uh, when you're being insulted and persecuted, <laughs> persecuted uh, is, is when, you know, you are uh, talking about God. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely.
Other thoughts, questions? The other kind of neat thing about the Beatitudes, okay, so you're, you're kind of going through the Beatitudes of life, right, and going through life, and Jesus says, uh, blessed are the merciful, but uh, learn it, I didn't have very much mercy today, I yelled at the kids, and I wasn't patient with my spouse, and I, I didn't do very merciful things today, um, you, you know, what happens then, you go back to, oh, that's right, I'm also poor in spirit, <laughs> Okay, thank you, God, for blessing me, even though I'm poor in spirit, and even though I can't do this on my own, you bless me, and you've made me part of your kingdom. Thank you, Jesus, All right? And then what do you do? You go through life, and you're like, okay, uh, now I'm a merciful one today. Hey, I'm doing pretty good in mercy today, um, but, uh, but then I'm not pure in heart, or then I'm not a you know, peacemaker in terms of sharing God's, God's message of love, or whatever it is, right? What happens when you falter and fall like that? You come back to verse Verse three, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's right, I'm poor in spirit, but I'm still part of God's kingdom because he's forgiven me in Jesus Christ. And he's given me the gift of salvation. You know? And so, uh, uh, it's, and as Jesus goes through this whole Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> he's talking about how disciples should be living their life. And over and over again, the honest listener is gonna say, well, I'm not doing that. Well, I'm not doing that. Well, I'm not doing that. I must be in trouble. No, Jesus doesn't want us to think, gosh, I must be in trouble. He wants us to come back to verse three and say, that's right, I'm poor in spirit, but I'm blessed because of the forgiveness and salvation of Jesus Christ. And then we go back through and say, okay, what am I supposed to do now? Uh-oh, I'm not doing that. What do I do? I come back to verse three again. See, it's kind of this constant loop as God's people, you know? Um, where we realize, oh, I messed up, I fall short, I failed. Well, I come back to verse three, I'm blessed because I'm poor in spirit, even though in spite of the fact that I'm poor in spirit. So that's kind of the way we'll read the Beatitudes. That's why I think Jesus starts out, or I'm sorry, the Sermon on the Mount, that's why I think he starts out with the Beatitudes is, is he wants to know this is our starting point, right? We're starting from this point of being blessed, being saved, being redeemed children of God. And now here's what we do. And when you fail, what you do, you come back to the starting point and remind yourself that you are a blessed, saved, redeemed child of God. Good. Good. We went a little longer than normal, but I, the attitudes are one of those things, you know, we could take five weeks to study it or we could you don't really try and get it in in one week. So we got it in. We did good. Let's close with a word of prayer. God, we are blessed. We are blessed because of what you've done for us in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you for that blessing. May we uh, know and, and receive and feel and experience that blessing again today as we, as we know your grace. And God, though, that blessing causes us to hunger and thirst for more because we live in a broken world. We live broken lives and, and we look forward to that which is better. And so help us as we live with this tension of being part of your people, but not yet being perfected, uh, having your blessing, but not yet fully having all the benefits. We pray that this would never cause us to lose heart or be discouraged, but that you, Lord, would always encourage and remind us of the blessings that are to come through Jesus Christ. We pray that as we uh, go our homeward way today, that, that you would just help us to live this disciple life as those who are merciful, as those who bring peace, as those who are meek and lowly, as those who hunger and thirst for something better. Create those things within us, God each and every day. Guard and keep us all on our homeward way. Be with those who couldn't join us today and gather us again safely in the near future. We can continue to study your word and celebrate what it means to be your blessed children of God. In Jesus' name, amen.